Dr. Anthony Fauci denounced former Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director Robert Redfield's assertion that Fauci excluded him because of his view that COVID came from a lab. The former White House chief medical advisor told News Nation's Andrew Cuomo that Redfield is wrong on every level. Let's watch. You know, it's really sad, Chris, that he's wrong on every single account. But you don't need to take my word for it. You take the word for the people. He's saying that the phone call to discuss the possibility that this might have been engineered, that I was in charge of the phone call and I deliberately excluded him because his, his ideas differed from what he interpreted were mine. Well, first of all, he had no idea what my ideas were because I kept a completely open mind. Secondly, I was not responsible. I didn't include or exclude anybody from the call because the people that were responsible for setting up the call were Jeremy Farrar from the Wellcome Trust in the UK, Eddie Holmes from... Uh, from Australia, and a, and a bunch of other very competent evolutionary virologists. So for, for him to say, and it's sad that he's so wrong, and, and he's publicly saying that, that I excluded him. Fauci came under fire after multiple U.S. agencies concluded that coronavirus most likely came from a lab. If you recall, Redfield unleashed before a House Select subcommittee investigating the COVID-19 pandemic last week. Let's revisit what he said. Why do you think you were excluded from those calls? I, I, because it was, uh, was told to me that uh, they wanted a single narrative and that I obviously had a different point of view. Do you think that the paper does hide the truth? I think it's an inaccurate paper that basically was part of a narrative that they were creating. Remember, this pandemic did not start in January at the seafood market. We now know there was infections all the way back into September. And again, Fauci has uh, vehemently denied Redfield's claims. So, Brianna, what did you make of this kerfuffle over who set up the call and whether Dr. Redfield was excluded? Yeah, I, I don't know that Redfield has given, frankly, uh, enough evidence to say with certainty whether or not uh, Fauci was in charge of the call and if Fauci personally excluded him. I think it's perfectly plausible that he or others would have been excluded from calls or suffered other kind of access or even professional consequences from taking a politically disadvantageous view of the origin of COVID. I think that's Likely, given how much pressure people have felt, I, I felt as a journalist, even discussing the issue over the last uh, three years or so. But I also do think that these kinds of administrative choices, there's it's, there's a certain ease to blaming someone who has a lot of uh, visibility, um, who might actually have the sentiment that you're accusing them of, but who might not actually have been involved in the particular instance that you're you're charging them with now. So, you know, just because Fauci was not the one that put together the call doesn't mean that Redfield sense that he was pushed out in part because of his views on lab leak aren't true. But, you know, without having direct knowledge of it, I mean, this feels like such a thing, silly thing to quibble over, but that's, I guess, where this conversation has landed. What do you make of it? Yeah, well, it reminded me a lot of um, this week on The Bachelor was the Women Tell All episode, um, which is when they get to, like, fight about what happened, you know, in retrospect. And, it, you know, it, there is a little bit of that to it, right? It's a little bit like you kind of can't look away. It's kind of gossipy. It's sort of like, oh, was he excluded from the call, right? You know, but of course, that's not the important question. The important question is how did it happen that we all got bought into this system where we were not allowed to speak, you know, a, it felt very much to people who are part of the establishment that there are things you're not allowed to say or that you're risking your career saying, right? Of course, you still said them, I still said them, people still said them. But if you said them not in the context of conservative media, you were taking a big, it was a big gamble to say that stuff. And how did that happen? How was that enforced? How was the regime enforced? How are all these things that we now know were not true become, you know, how was that? And and that, that stuff is really important to get to the bottom of, you know, even even when it feels a little bit, you know, who was on the call, who wasn't on the call, I agree with you. Like, you know, th that is not the focus. The focus should be on, you know, how did that end up happening? The American people got, you know, hoodwinked in this way. And, you know, I, I still, F Fauci could still convince me that, you know, he had good intentions if he would admit the mistakes, right? I mean, I think that's the problem with him. Mm. It's like, he won't admit any error, which is, if he said, look, I was doing my best. I lied on this day for this purpose. You know, that that seemed right to me. Now it seems like maybe that was a mistake. We, we, 
we we insisted that schools close down. I, it felt right at the time. Now I realize in retrospect that was the wrong move. You know, we ignored natural immunity. Now we realize that that was like really important. We funded gain gain of function research, and like now we realize that that's really dangerous, and the American people don't want that, right? If he would just admitted that. You know, but but it's this constant gaslighting, the inability to admit that there were people who happened to be your political rivals who got it right when you were getting it wrong. Maybe not. They're not better people. They just happen to get it right. And you have to at some point acknowledge and have the humility to say, like, look, these were the mistakes. And how can anyone trust you until you do that? Yeah, it was refreshing to see, of all people, uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer uh, make some comments to that end. We covered on the show earlier this week, you know, saying that some of the COVID era policies didn't make a lot of sense, preventing people from going to parks and doing certain kinds of outdoor activity that are frankly low risk and good for people's mental health and, and things like that. And I do agree that part of the issue and why uh, Fauci has become such a lightning rod is that he was both incredibly visible and has been resistant to making a kind of full-throated uh, apology for some, I think, just tactical errors that aren't necessarily even made in bad faith. I think some of them might have been, but some of them were just people trying to figure out things as we went along in the middle of a crisis that felt very exigent, especially before the vaccines came out and people who were healthy were dying with some regularity from, from this thing. But I also think that sometimes this broader conversation about what actually happened, who's legally culpable, um, and, and what kind of preventative measures need to go into effect aren't happening because I don't know. Liberals are so defensive of Fauci at this point because they perceive him as being the victim of unfair attacks and unfair focus. Um, makes them unwilling to engage in some of the more important questions about what happened actually, what we were funding, who legally is responsible because of their they're actually having funded these kinds of um, of these projects. And sometimes I wonder if maybe we focus a little bit less on what Fauci's specific role was and whether or not he set up the call, um, we would be able to get more transparency or, or get closer to figuring out what actually happened in a substantive way. Because Fauci's like not even in it anymore. He's retired, and a little, it's a little bit, it's a little bit exhausting to think that if we topple Fa Fauci. Um, we're going to suddenly resolve all the world's um, COVID issues, which seems to me to be very much obviously not the case. That's not me saying I, I want him to be off the hook for whatever it is he is responsible for, but I would I would like it if the conversation broadened out a little bit beyond him, I think. And what's especially interesting is, you know, it would be one thing if it was the people who felt that, you know, take extremist measures, because if you don't take the extremist measures, then, you know, you're going to have all of this loss of life. It's the side that felt that, you know, COVID was less dangerous, right? Um, that is sort of going after him for having put up, you know, for meaning that the, the, the losses they're trying to recoup by going after him, it's not that sort of feeling that like, you know, millions are dead, you know, and what if you, what if you were responsible for it? It's, it's the feeling that like, you know, I also very bad things happened, right? Because of his directives, you know, mental health crisis among children, people who couldn't be with their family members, you know, um, lockdowns, um, 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 you know, school loss, businesses, failures, like these are all really big deals, but it's not the side that, you know, is it. And, and, and I'll just tell you a really interesting story on that front, which is somebody was recently telling me about how uh, they're a very close friend of theirs. Their father was one of the first COVID deaths and mm. how traumatic that's been for this person that he couldn't, um, he, he couldn't bury him, um, you know, in a religious way. He couldn't sit Shiva for him. He couldn't see him. It was like his father was there and his father was gone. And then my and then the person telling me this story says, so he's very, very angry at conservatives. And I was like, I, I thought he was going to say, so he's very angry at China. You know, like, why would you be angry at conservatives? They didn't kill your father. Like what? How? Where? I think I not. So I think if the point I think I agree with your point, Brianna, which is like, there are people to be angry at and we should spend less time being angry at each other and less time in and more time in constructive ways of making sure that we don't make the same mistakes, both in terms of, you know, funding research that could end up being dangerous and in terms of destroying businesses and, and children's futures, especially lower income kids. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a horrible story, you know, and it's worth noting, you know, China didn't kill his father either. And, you know, well, we, yes, obviously, you know, yes, but, but, yes, but, but, but these but, words, I mean, he used, yeah. he used the word, I think, directive early with respect to Anthony Fauci. And the thing that he keeps saying is, I was giving advice. States were making up their own rules. I was not a politician. I was not the president. And there's something to that. I, I don't want to minimize yeah. the value of CDC or the weight of CDC advice. But I do think that a lot of people need to look to their local elected leaders and put yeah. some blame there.
because Fauci is able to answer all of those kinds of questions. Like, look, all I did was my best and I gave these advisory opinions, but you can't hold me responsible for whatever law was in your state and wherever that allowed you not to be able to keep the body in a home, sit shiva, do whatever typical burial practices that you wanted to do. And blaming someone who literally cannot be held accountable because they were just giving an advisory opinion, I don't think helps anybody process through, I think, a lot of legitimate anger in a healthy way. But it's, it's a tough question for sure, and I'm sure we'll keep talking about it here on Rising. We'll have more Rising for you right after this.